look at the last chapters we're going to be doing this week. Chapter 34, Three More Feet. This had better be worth my while, snapped Stidworth five minutes later as he entered the blue parlour where the spy was waiting for him. Your lordship, said the breathless man, they're saying the monster's hopping. They're saying what? Hopping, my lord, hopping, he panted. They've noticed all the prints are made by the same left foot. Spittleworth stood speechless. It had never occurred to him that the common folk might be clever enough to spot a thing like that. Indeed, he, who'd never had to look after a living creature in his life, not even his own horse, hadn't stopped to consider the fact that a creature's feet might not all make the same prints on the ground. Must I think of everything? bellowed Spittleworth and he stormed out of the parlour and off to the guard's room where he found Major Roach drinking wine and playing cards with some friends. The Major leapt to his feet at the sight of Spittleworth who beckoned him to come outside. I want you to assemble the Ichabog Defence Brigade immediately, Roach, Spittleworth told the Major in a low voice. You'll arrive north and be sure to make plenty of noise as you go. I want everyone from Shoeville to Jeroboam to see you passing by. Then once you're up there, spread out and mount a guard over the border of the marsh. But, began Major Roach, who's just got, who'd got used to a life of ease and plenty at the palace, with occasional rides around Shoeville in full uniform. I don't want butts, I want action, shouted Spittleworth. Rumours are flying, there's nobody stationed in the north. Go now and make sure you wake up as many people as possible as you go, but leave me two men, Roach, just two. I have another small job for them. So the grumpy Roach ran off to assemble his troops and Spittleworth proceeded alone to the dungeons. The first thing he heard when he got there was the sound of Mr Dovetail, who was still singing the national anthem. Be quiet, bellowed Spittleworth, drawing his sword and gesturing to the warden to let Mr Dove in him into Mr Dovetail's cell. The carpenter appeared quite different to the last time Lord Spittleworth had seen him. Since learning that he wasn't to be let out of the dungeon to see it, Daisy, a wild look had appeared in Mr Dovetail's eye. Of course, he hadn't been able to shave for weeks either and his hair had grown rather long. I said, be quiet, barked Spittleworth, because the carpenter, who didn't seem able to seem able to help himself, was still humming the national anthem. I need another three feet. Do you hear me? One more left foot and two right. Do you understand me, carpenter? Mr Dovetail stopped humming. If I carve them, will you let me out to see my daughter, my lord? He asked in a hoarse, more, in a hoarse voice. Spittleworth smiled. It was clear to him that the man was going slowly mad, because only a madman would imagine he'd be let out after making another three Ichabog feet. Of course I will, said Spittleworth. I shall have wood delivered to you first thing tomorrow morning. Work hard, carpenter. When you're finished, I'll let you out to see your daughter. When Spittleworth emerged from the dungeons, he found two soldiers waiting for him just as he'd requested. Spittleworth led these men up to his private apartments, made sure Cankerby the footman wasn't skulking about, locked the door and turned to give the men their instructions. There will be 50 ducats for each of you if you succeed in this job, he said, and the soldiers looked excited. You are to follow Lady Islander tomorrow morning, no um, follow Lady Islander morning, noon and night, you understand me? She must not know you are following her. You will wait for a moment when she is quite alone so you can kidnap her. Without anyone hearing or seeing anything, if she escapes or you are seen, I shall deny that I gave this order and put you to death. What do we do once we've got her? asked one of the soldiers, who no longer looked excited but very scared. Hmm, said Spittleworth, turning to look out of the window, while he considered what best to do with Loslander. Well, a lady of the court isn't it the same as a butcher. The Igabog can't enter the palace and eat her. No, I think it's best said Spittleworth, a so slow smile spreading over his crafty face. If you take Lazy Islanda to my estate in the country, send word once you've got her there and I'll join you. Oh no, they're going to kidnap, kidnap Lady Islanda as well. Chapter 35, Lord Spittleworth's Proposal. A few days later, Lady Islanda was walking alone in the palace rose garden when the two soldiers, hiding in a bush, spotted their chance. They seized her, ganked her, bound her hands and drove her away to Spittleworth's estate in the country. Then they sent a message to Spittleworth and waited for him to join them. Spittleworth promptly summoned Lazy Islander's maid, Millicent. By threatening to murder Millicent's little sister, he forced her to deliver messages to all his Lady Islander's friends, telling them that her mistress had decided to become a nun. Lady Islander's friends were all shocked by this news. She never mentioned wanting to become a nun to any of them. In fact, several of them were suspicious that Lord Spittleworth had had something to do with her sudden disappearance. 
However, I'm sad to tell you that Spittleworth is now so wildly feared, widely feared that apart from whispering their suspicions to each other, his Londa's friends did nothing to either find her or ask Spittleworth what he knew. Perhaps even worse was the fact that none of them tried to help Millicent, who was caught by soldiers trying to flee the city within the city and imprisoned within in the dungeons. Next, Spittleworth had set out for his country estate, where he arrived late the following evening. After giving each of his Landers kidnappers 50 ducats and reminding them that if they talked, he'd have them executed, Lord Spittleworth smoothed his thin moustache in the mirror and went to find Lady Islander, who was sitting in his rather dusty library, reading a book by candlelight. Good evening, my lady, said Spittleworth, sweeping her bow. Lady Islander looked at him in silence. I have good news for you, continued Spittleworth. You are to become the wife of the chief adviser. I'd sooner die, said Lady Islander pleasantly, and turning a page in a book, she continued to read. Come, come, said Spittleworth. As you can see, my house really needs a woman's tender care. You'll be far happier here making yourself useful than pining over the cheesemaker's son, who in any case is likely to starve to death any day now. Lazy Islander, who'd expected Spittleworth to mention Captain Goodfellow, had been preparing for this moment ever since she arrived in the cold, dirty house. So she said with neither a blush nor a tear, I stopped caring for Captain Goodfellow a long time ago, Lord Spittleworth. The sight of him confessing to treason disgusted me. I could never love a treacherous man, which is why I could never love you. She said it so convincingly that Spittleworth believed her. He tried a different threat and told Lady he, her he'd kill her parents if she didn't marry him. But Lady Islander reminded him that she, like Captain Goodfellow, was an orphan. Then Spittleworth said he'd take away all her jewellery, all the jewellery her mother had left her. But she shrugged and said she preferred books anyway. Finally, Spittleworth threatened to kill her. And Lady Islander said she, he gets on with it because that would be far better than listening to him talk. Oh, she's very witty. Spittleworth was enraged. He'd become used to having everything his own way, to having his own way and everything. And here was something he couldn't have. And it only made him want it all the more. Finally, he said if she liked books so much, he'd lock her up inside the library forever. He'd have bars fitted on all the windows and scrumble the butler would bring her food three times a day, but she would only ever leave the room to go to the bathroom unless she agreed to marry him. Then I shall die in this room, said Lady Islander calmly. Or perhaps, who knows, in the bathroom. As he couldn't get another word out of her, the furious chief advisor left. Well, at least Lady Islander's sticking to her principles, isn't she? Chapter 36. Cornucopia Hungry. A year passed, then two, then three, four and five. The tiny kingdom of Cornucopia, which had once been the envy of its neighbours for its magically rich soil, for the skills of its cheesemakers, winemakers and pastry chefs, and for the happiness of its people, had changed almost beyond recognition. True Shoeville was carrying on more or less as it always had. Spidworth didn't want the king to notice that anything had changed, so he spent plenty of gold in the capital to keep things running as they always had, especially in the city within the city. Up in the northern cities, though, people were struggling. More and more businesses, shops, taverns, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, farms and vineyards were closing down. The Ichabog tax was pushing people into poverty, and as if that weren't, wasn't bad enough, everyone feared being the next to receive a visit from the Ichabog or whatever it was that broke down doors and left monster-like tracks around houses and farms. People who voiced doubts about whether the Ichabog was real, but really behind these attacks, were usually next to receive a visit from the Dark Footers. That was the name Spittleworth and Roach had given the, to the squads of men who murdered unbelievers in the night, leaving footprints around their victims' houses. Occasionally, though, the Ichabog doubters lived in the middle of a city where it was difficult to fake an attack without all the neighbours seeing. In this case, Spittleworth would hold a trial, and by threatening their families, as he had with Goodfellow and his friends, he made the accused agree that they'd committed treason. Increasing numbers of trials meant Spittleworth had to oversee the building of more jails. He also needed more orphanages. Why did he need orphanages, you ask? Well, in the first place, quite a number of parents were being killed or imprisoned. imprisoned. As everyone was now finding it difficult to feed their own families, they weren't able to take in the abandoned children. In the second place, poor people were dying of hunger as parents usually fed their children rather than themselves. Children were often the last of the family left alive. And in the third place, some heartbroken homeless families were giving up their children to orphanages because it was the only way they could make sure their children would have food and shelter. I wonder if you remember the palace maid, Hetty, who so bravely warned Lady Islander that Captain Goodfellow and his friends were about to be executed. Well, Hetty used Lady Islander's gold 
to take a coach home to her father's vineyard just outside Jeroboam. A year later, she man called, married a man called Hopkins and gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl. However, the effort of paying the Ichabog tax was too much for the Hopkins family. They lost their little grocery store and Hetty's parents couldn't help them because shortly after losing their vineyard, they'd starved to death. Homeless now, their children crying with hunger, Hetty and her husband walked in despair to Mar Grunter's orphanage. The twins were torn, sobbing from their mother's arms, the door slammed and the bolts banged home. And poor Hetty Hopkins and her husband walked away, crying no less hard than their children, and praying that Mar Gunter would keep them alive. Oh, we're going to have to read another chapter because it's getting very gripping. Chapter 37, Daisy and the Moon. Mar Grunter's orphanage had changed a great deal since Daisy Dovetail had been taken there in a sack. The broken down hovel was now an enormous stone, build stone building with bars on the windows, locks on every door and a space for a hundred children. Daisy was still there, grown much taller and thinner, but still wearing the overalls in which she'd been kidnapped. She sewed lengths onto the arms and legs so they still fit, and patched them carefully when they tore. They were the last thing she had of her home and her father, and so she kept on wearing them. Instead of making herself dresses out of the sacks of the cabbages came in, as Martha and the other big girls did. Daisy had held on to the idea that her father was still alive for several long years after her kidnap. She was a clever girl and had always known her father didn't believe in the Ichabog. So she forced herself to believe that he was in a cell somewhere, looking up through the barred window at the same moon she watched every night before she fell asleep. Then one night in her sixth year at Mar Granta's, after tucking the Hopkins twins in for the night and promising them that they'd see their mummy and daddy again soon, Daisy lay down, lay down beside Martha and looked up at the pale gold disc in the sky as usual and realised she no longer believed her father was still alive. The hope had left her heart like a bird fleeing a ransacked nest, nest. And though tears leaked out of her eyes, she told herself that her father was in a better place now, up there in the glorious heavens with her mother. She tried to find comfort in the idea that, being no longer earthbound, her parents could live anywhere, including in her own heart, and that she must keep their memories alive inside her, like a flame. Still, it was hard to have parents who lived inside you when all you really wanted was for them to come back and hug you. Unlike many of the orphanage children, Daisy retained a clear memory of her parents. The memory of their love sustained her, and every day she helped look after the little ones in the orphanage and made sure they had hugs and kindness she was missing herself. And it wasn't only the thought of her mother and father that enabled Daisy to carry on. She had a strange feeling she was meant to do something important, something that would change not only her own life, but the fortunes of Cornucopia. She'd never told anyone about this strange feeling, not even her best friend Martha, yet it was a source of her strength, her, de her chance, Daisy felt sure, would come. And that's the last chapter for this week. So we'll see you on Monday to find out what happens next.